I, being a white person, the, with, uh, in a loving way, they will call us in the Amazon region, uh, among the Avahun and Wampis, they will call us the Apaches, the white ones from origin. But then they distinguish white ones which are united with them and in friendship, in solidarity. And together what we feel is the colonization is not over in Peru. And yeah, I'm also coming from a country, uh, from my own history, uh, where also power was used very badly to overrule um, and cause a lot of damage to other peoples on the earth. So um, here I'm now living in a country where colonization ended in terms of um, a period of time, dominion of Spain over Latin America was over, but the way of thinking and feeling did not change. And uh, this very important statement you can read here, and I will read also together with you now, is from the Commission of Truth and Reconciliation. It came into office after 20 years of violence we suffered in Peru uh, between Shining Path and the second terrorist organization and military forces and police forces in Peru with more than 70,000 people dead and a lot of people missing. And they tried to name the root causes and they said, with the independence of the colonial dominion came to an end, but the internal colonial structures of power remained untouched till then. And so the young-born uh, Peruvian Republic already started as a republic which continued the discourse of the colonial times, where white people and their cultures per se were considered of more value, of more esteem than indigenous peoples and their culture. So we got off a very poor start. And there are mindsets, colonial mindsets, very present till today in our relationships. And there is the colonial wound we are all affected by because it makes, it affects our being human, our humanity. So the indigenous peoples suffering the very um, strong impact on it, and those ones who practice this dominion in such a way, also um, sometimes without even knowing and, and being conscious of it, suffer that their humanity is diminishing by relating in such a way. So there is, after the terrible wound of 20 years of violence in Peru, there's at least a strive to overcome, step by step, these ways of relating to each other which only are causing damage, wounds to ourselves, and the violence is projected into many relationships among generations, among the different cultures in Peru, and also to Earth. And it is reflected also in the relationship men, women, in what we call machismo and sexismo. It goes together. Where do I, together with indigenous peoples with whom I'm siding in the struggle in the Amazon region against the major projects uh, to exploit the earth, where do we experience very much the presence of colonial thinking? That in the conflict, the root cause is also what we call an epistemological, epistemological conflict. Different ways of generating knowledge, of generating insights, and where those ones who are more from coming from the Western um, way of thinking will not acknowledge as an equal level indigenous ways of generating knowledge and deep insight and wisdom as we deeply um, need it in our times to overcome the violent patterns of behavior and of relating to each other and to earth. And so we could say what is characteristic of the indigenous way of generating knowledge, the main approach they take, it's analogical thinking. They use metaphors, they use poetic language, they use storytelling, um, they use symbols, which is a more integral, intuitive way of uh, generating knowledge and um, communicating it. While the Western way of doing it mainly, not only, but mainly is an analytical way of thinking which can give us concepts, which can give us very um, clear facts and has its place, but 
it can remain as a, what we call in Spanish a conocimiento frío, a cold way of knowing. It doesn't touch your heart. It doesn't involve the whole person. And uh, to say investigations show that this way of knowing uh, does not help us um, alone in the ecological crisis we are facing. Because, um, yeah, you can have a lot of facts about pollution, contamination, violation to earth. Does it change mainly way of acting, of behaving? No. If not, uh, but after so many years of deepened knowledge, there would be a different response uh, worldwide of the majority of people. So it shows we need to connect both ways of knowing deeply and urgently to overcome the crisis. And there is a gift indigenous peoples bring to us with their wisdom and way of knowing. But we have to be open to it, to receive it. And so it's dominance, one way of knowing about the other ones, which causes damage to all of us. And when we also um, do not appreciate really the indigenous languages in their beauty, thank you when you have been singing, um, there is something, a richness we lack and like we withhold from humanity in these times of crisis. Because each language is a treasure, it shows one way of looking at the world. Therefore the glasses. Each language helps me. And when I'm open to more languages, the horizon widens. I can get more sensitive. Wisdom can grow. I like very much what Hertha Müller, uh, one woman who has been gaining a couple of years ago, the Nobel Prize for Literature said, each language views the world in a different way and has found all its vocabulary through this view. In each language are sitting different eyes in the words and also different sounds and energy which go with it. Um, so, therefore, what indigenous peoples or the ones with whom I'm linked very much, what I learned from them and I'm learning day by day, what unites, they look first not what separates and distinguishes human beings from other living beings, but what do we have in common, what unites us. That is the main focus. And it is that we are all subjects. The other living beings are no objects for um, a vampis or a wahoon, man or woman. They all possess what is, we can, wakan. You can only translate it in our language with soul. But not in a Christian sense of soul. Soul means to be fully alive, to have vitality, and to have ability to enter into communication. You can communicate, therefore, with all living beings. And their powerful songs, uh, Arnand called, are ways of communicating. Mm -hmm. And my friend Santiago Manuin, he would say, therefore, as we are living in a big uh, community of living beings, the rainforest, the waterfalls, the rivers on our land, animals and plants, are our brothers and sisters, the deep inner link with affection. Our people are living together with the forest, hmm? form community with the forest, and then you treat the forest differently than just only as a resource which you exploit. So life is, and that I'm learning more and more and deeply, is life is lived in relationship. We are relational beings, that is what marks us all. And if this holds true, then Avahun and Vampis would say there is not only reciprocity in the relationship among each other, but it is also with earth, with nature. You honor nature, you honor earth when you ask what does she offer me and what do I give back to her. And there is always something you can give back. And the rites and rituals are one way of honoring and giving back. You do not just take out. It's the different, very different approach than the capitalistic approach of extracting, extractive in industries, as we are suffering them in Peru. And you live solidarity among the others and with Earth. Reciprocity for me has also the beautiful thing, each one has something to give, and each one is in need of the other one to receive something. We are not just completely autonomous, independent beings. Also the mutual relationship as, as Santiago, and you see him now after having suffered the impact of the conflict of Bagua, I will comment on it later. The rainforest cares for us if we in turn care for the rainforest, mutuality in this relationship. And the rainforest is for them 
uh, the place where you receive food, where you receive life energy, where you receive also what you need for healing. There are the medical plants they know to take out and get. I always like very much how Leonardo Boff, the Brazilian theologian, um, is working very hard to say the deep insights, the cosmo vision, uh, the way the world view of the indigenous peoples is not a trad traditionalist once, as in Peru often it is said. Backward, traditionalist, mythic, it uh, is not in congruence with modern science. He just expresses beautifully what we all deeply are convinced of and try to say, and say it in society, to change ways of thinking. The ancestral vision combines with what is more modern in the fields of biology and cosmology. Important scientists, like for example John Lovelock, have proven that the indigenous have it right. The Earth is in fact a living superorganism, and it is gifted with an overwhelming vitality which needs to be honored by us and recognized by us. <coughs> and it goes together, this integral view of we are relational beings, we are part of the Earth, uh, this web of life, with a high significance of the traditional territory it has for the indigenous. And that is in uh, the colonial, and we would say today it's neo-colonial way of relating, often not acknowledged at all, that the indigenous live, as Santiago would say, in a very close relationship with his, her territory. This is more than the earth on which we plant and from which we harvest. It is the place of our ancestors, of our holy sites, of our cosmovision and religiosity. There is a place you know, you honor, you feel linked to. And therefore also a friend of mine, Fidel Tubino, he is a very engaged anthropologist, we work together. He said it for me so uh, precisely, for the indigenous people, the territory is not a thing, not an object. But, and here comes our problem in the struggle uh, with the state, and the companies. In the legal conception of Peru, it is an object in front of a subject. Yeah. In contrast, for the indigenous, the territory is part of them, and they are part of the territory. Because in Peruvian law, we have the Anglo-Saxon law. What is under the earth belongs to the state. What is above the earth, you can have a title. Indigenous peoples have the title of their communities, they are owners of the land. But this title doesn't help you when they find gold, oil, and other things under the earth. Then it belongs to the whole nation, and they say, common good, as they would declare it, prevails over the good of some groups of people. And there our struggle is to say that is short-sighted, and it is also not taken into consideration the integral um, way of thinking, of looking at the world, understanding the world of the indigenous peoples. It's violating them and their cosmovision. The territory is one, above the earth and under the earth. For us, neocolonization, beside all what Melina already mentioned, means also we continue a way of treating the earth since colonial times. Since colonial times, Latin America was a place to be exploited, their minerals to be exported to Europe, and later on to the States and Canada now. And um, neo-extractivism, uh, neo-colonization in the form of extractivism that you take out, uh, exploit the earth, take out all the resources. Um, what is new, new in it? New in it is that now the nation state is more involved. Could, could make prevail rights of the peoples uh, in front of enterprises. But the experience of the indigenous peoples in Peru is, and we who are siding with them experience the same, uh, that often the state is not assuming its responsibility to be on the side of the citizens who are more vulnerable. But there is a strong lobbyism uh, of enterprises um, in the um, different ministry, ministers and ministries of the state with whom you have to deal. Right now, Peru is among the countries in Latin America who have part of the Amazon, the most advanced ones, one in uh, giving concessions of the Amazon region to enterprises. More than 80% of the Peruvian Amazon region is divided into sections, we call them lotus, 
for concessions to be obtained by enterprises for exploration first, they see whether it is worthwhile to go into the ground there to invest and then for exploitation. And the division, it's for me that is one strong way of violence, of new colonization. People, the state goes, draws up a, a big map, forms these sections, gives them out and mainly the people who are living there since centuries are not involved, are not asked, it's just done to the land. And they're expected to keep quiet when this happens. Um, this is by um, a group of specialists, of experts who side with indigenous peoples. They have published uh, three years ago, Amazonia under pressure, bajo presión. They have done a very thorough study. study. You can see all what is exploited, gas, petrol, the uh, plants for uh, generating energy out of water. You have a lot of um, land roads constructed, often not in need of the people, but of the enterprises, through the rainforest uh, and other very sensitive uh, ecological areas. Deforestation, because there is a whole traffic uh, with the very valuable uh, wood we have. And they come to the conclusion that if this continues, for only a few more years, the ecosystems of the Amazon region will collapse. They will not be able to withstand all this pressure. And for Peru, it is even worse. Those ones who have, uh, experts who have uh, done a very thorough study on Peru say, in the year 2021, when Peru will celebrate 200 years of independence, if we continue like this, the major part of our Amazon region um, will have collapsed and will have suffered irreparable damage. For the Avahun and Wampis, it's a question of future, it's a struggle for their own life, for their future and their dignity. So they have uh, the bad luck that gold and oil has been found on their ground and so a very large, large section, Lotte 116, is just overlapping with a traditional territory and so they have to strive that uh, their rights will be recognized, given to them by the Convention 169 of the International Labour Organization that in case of major projects, indigenous peoples have to be consulted. And this implies also they have to be informed. Uh, they have to be informed by people who are not sided with the enterprises. They have the right to receive um, a whole diversified information to then go through process of discernment and decide whether they give, uh, whether they will agree to a project or not. What is at stake? Oil, gas, gold. They want it for agribusiness. They want several plants. Because of one of the plants, there's even the plan to have a big dam constructed and a vast area where there are a lot of um, uh, Avahun villages will be flooded if this project would come true. And so that will mean a whole struggle. People won't take this. Here you see it, how it goes. You just, like in, in one part, they flew by helicopters. I don't know how many flights they did to bring in all the equipment, the major equipment, for exploration only. It's uh, two companies, Morlet Prom, French origin, um, and uh, uh, Pacific Rubiales, Colombian, Canadian capital. They are, the second one is the the bigger company, um, very bad relationship with the major part of the communities, a lot of division has happened, trying to, to offer some benefits uh, to leaders. Wherever they enter, of course, they change the ecosystem of the rainforest. Uh, and uh, what is a major point of discussion, how do you define the impact area? So they want only to say the narrow impact area where you have three, four uh, villages, uh, indigenous villages close by. And people are striving, our leaders are fighting and saying that is wrong because knowing the Amazon, knowing the very complex water system, once you enter at one point, you have so many peoples and their communities affected. So that is one struggle we are going through. Then we make the painful experience, yeah, you, they come with a lot of money, they come with very attractive benefits, and also some of the leaders of communities are becoming weak and informing not completely their communities. So, they are aiming, 
the companies and the government major gain in a short time. Briberies at all levels, corruption at all levels, and very painful divisions among communities. How to face it and how to achieve that those one who try to divide, still they are in the minority. But we know by things which have happened, very painful things, we have to be very alert. And how do we do deal also with it that some people have not been honest, that they have been misusing trust which has been given to them. That has been a very painful experience for us. And to talk about the Amazon region and Amazon and Wampis peoples, you cannot do it without talking about a very dark day in the history of those peoples in Peru. It is the 5th of June, 2009. Even for me, till now, it is not easy to talk about it because it was an outbreak of violence which was absolutely unnecessary. The indigenous peoples peacefully, democratically, had fought for their rights that the former president would not achieve through Congress to bring in a change of very fundamental laws for them, laws which would have, if the change would have taken place, made it much more easy for companies to come in to um, become owners of part of the communal lands and also to use the forest. Um, the indigenous peoples did not want the confrontation the bishop of the place, a very committed man, was present in the night of the 4th of June 2009 when the leaders, the main leaders who had organized a whole protest and f a peaceful blockade of a main road when government didn't listen in other ways before, they just wanted to sit at the table and to negotiate as equal partners. But the president with certain ministers ordered in the very early morning of June 5th that those indigenous men and also groups of women who have been there along the road peacefully getting ready to go back to their uh, villages the same day would be attacked from above by a hel helicopter in the early morning hours and then very heavily armed police which is normally used to fight terrorism would come down the hill. One of my friends Santiago Manuin was one of the leaders who went up the hill when their own people gave the voice of alarm to say, please don't shoot. We are leaving today. Let us end this peacefully. Nobody knows why the first heavily armed policeman shot several of the unarmed uh, indigenous leaders. And then, of course, there was an outbreak. The people gave a cry and said, that is war. And then there was a fight man to man. And then the weapons they conquered, yeah, they also made use of them. So the outcome was horrible, more than 30 people dead, more than 180 people heavily injured, a violence which could have been avoided. And um, Santiago Manuin nearly lost his life because he was shot down being completely unarmed. People were taken like this, and the only ones who until now have to stand in court are the indigenous ones. In not one moment, those people of the government, and we can prove what they said, um, where they did not tell the truth afterwards, their documents um, which prove, otherwise not one of those responsible for the orders given had ever to respond for the violence and the suffering inflicted on the indigenous peoples, but also, and that is the, for me the human greatness of the indigenous, um, they recognized also the tremendous suffering of the mothers and fathers of the young soldiers sent into this region, which they did not know, and who also lost their lives. Church, we are siding with the indigenous. They asked us to please help them. It's an historical moment. Never ever so many indigenous had to stand in a court in Peru. And it's going on for five years. It's a hard struggle to just achieve that Cultural differences are recognized, it's recognized right to have a translator there. They even dared to open the first session without having a translator there. But the good thing is, step by step, I believe we can write some history. And I will comment tomorrow a little more on it. And these are the last pictures in the same region where I'm working with the Avahun and Wampis. We had an oil spill, a very bad one, in February also because of lack of maintenance uh, of the state company 
Petro Peru. And um, the people asked that their faces may not be shown, but what has been the tragedy? Um, they involved children. Company says they didn't do it, it were other people, but the question is why didn't you stop? Uh, what was going on there? 300 children are seriously sick by now because they were not told that the, you are not allowed to touch the oil with your hands. So they filled it into buckets and for the buckets they received some money. And now you have them with different heavy diseases because uh, of the poisoning. Well, and with this I want to conclude. I believe that these wounds can heal. We all need to be engaged of what we call decolonization. And descolonizar in Spanish is really, you get away from something. You want to get out of it. You want to overcome it. But you have to consciously take steps. And that is to help each other. And it is in communion with the Avahun and Vampis to decolonize our way of thinking, of feeling, and of being, because it penetrates our whole way of being. And at the same time, from the World Social Forum comes this word, which is an invitation, which is a call. Another world is possible. Another world where different strands of colors can come together, can build a new design. And um, yeah, I think it is a dream. It is a vision which is more than a dream, calling our energy forth to rebuild our web of life together and to help each other, knowing to beg pardon, but also to renew our commitments of love, of warning with each other and do it together. Thank you.